Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Vincent, this is Luc, and um, today we would like to talk about the transition that we made at Albert Ein towards a personalized search. Uh, Albert Ein is the largest supermarket in the Netherlands, and we think that personalization really helps improving the ranking. There's a lot of business reasons, uh, obviously, to do it, but we also have our own uh, personal reasons. And mine is just to get rid of my nagging mom, uh, because she's continuously telling me that the ranking and the recommendations are always catering to lar towards larger families. She's living by herself, uh, and we think that recommending her smaller portions will definitely help her to click on position one. So that's my personal uh, reason to do this. Yeah, so the one for me is uh, that the Netherlands is perhaps even more polarized on their favorite <coughs> brand of Pilsner than they are on politics. So when I go to a party and I tell people that I work at Search at Albert Heijn, the general reaction is, that I get is, why is Heineken ranked higher than my favorite brand of Pilsner? And then I have to explain to them, like, yeah, generally the Netherlands prefers Heineken. Uh, but it's a very sensitive topic for a lot of people. It's also not my favorite, so I would like to get rid of this question as well. So those are our personal reasons, and maybe just a small introduction. So my name is uh, Vincent Pijnenburg. Uh, my background is in uh, management and economics. Um, afterwards, I did traineeship in data science just to uh, go over to this side a bit more, and then I have seven years of experience now. Um, I started in uh, government, then I worked for an airline for five years, and the last year I've been at Albert Ein working in the search department. Yeah, so my name is uh, Luc Kaandorp. I've been working uh, at Albert Ein at search for one and a half years now. Uh, and uh, after, uh, before that, I've done a master's in artificial intelligence with a primary focus on uh, natural language processing and uh, information retrieval. Cool. Then what we would like to talk about today, well, we have a little bit of a background, but it's uh, going to be very short. Uh, then we start with uh, the setup that we had previously. Um, so we talk about lexical search and listwise uh, learning to rank. Um, and then we'll continue to talk with the changes that we have applied so that we can do personalized search and really change up the ranking for, uh, depending on the customer and his or her context. Um, afterwards, we're going to talk about our relevancy labels and how it incorporates uh, different uh, metrics that we try to optimize, some of the challenges uh, that we face and how we address those. Um, and then near the end, it's going to be more about semantic search and alternatives, a little uh, sidestep, and then the future of search at Albert Ein and the things that we uh, would still like to improve or work on. So just a little bit of uh, background just to get started. Um, well, as I explained, Albert Ein is the largest supermarket in the Netherlands. Uh, if you are Dutch, you definitely know Albert Ein. If you don't, maybe you have been at Schiphol and seen this uh, big blue uh, supermarket. Well, that is Albert Ein. Um, but we're also the largest online supermarket outcompeting uh, some of the supermarket only uh, online only supermarkets um, so that is still a growing market and a very competitive market um, but we are the leader the leader uh, currently and then I don't have to explain to you that search is very important but just uh, some of the highlights uh, search is still uh, the biggest uh, in terms of the place where customers add uh, products to their basket um, but what maybe is a little bit less obvious is that also for offline purchases, search plays uh, quite a big role. So one third of all of the searches is for uh, shopping in store. Uh, and there's two reasons. One is that customers can create a list um, online and then when they go to the store, uh, they uh, add all of the products to their basket and scan them and then immediately kind of like check off their list. Another one is uh, they might go to the store and are not able to find the products that they are looking for, and then they quickly get out their mobile and still use a search query to find what products do we have in that uh, segment and then try to find what they were looking for. So also offline is definitely still helping a lot. Uh, and then the bonus card. Um, probably most Dutch people who are at least living close by as, um, an Albert Ein have a bonus card. It's basically a loyalty program, so you have a card, if you scan it, you get a lot of discounts, so every Dutch person obviously uh, wants this. Um, but it also means that uh, when you go to the supermarket and when you uh, use a self-scanner, or when you use a, a scanner in the store, or when you go online and you start ordering, then immediately uh, we recognize you. So we are not depending on cookies or whatsoever. We immediately have access to your full purchase history and can recognize you as a customer and have all sorts of customer-based features uh, ready to personalize that search experience for you. 
It's something that we didn't uh, utilize previously. Um, so this talk is going to uh, go more in depth about why we can use this and how we're actually using this. And then some of the uh, requirements. Um, we have uh, P99 uh, latency of 100 milliseconds. Um, the amount of products is still reasonable and also the amount of queries is reasonable. There's a lot of um, repetitive buying behavior and also a lot of uh, repetitive uh, querying. So this uh, enables us, there's a little bit of space there to put, um, uh, put in some customer features and uh, improve the learning to rank uh, that we're using. Um, and that repetitive buying behavior is very important so we can truly understand a customer's needs based on his or her previous um, purchases and especially the customers who come back more frequently, we truly get to know them and we can cater the ranking uh, of the search results to them. Yep, perfect. Um, so to explain to you where we're going, we of course need to inform you what, where we're coming from, so our old situation. So search at Albert Heijn is composed of two parts, uh, like nowadays most search systems, the candidate retrieval, and after that we're doing a learning to rank, to re-rank these candidates into the optimal order for our customers. So what happens when a query comes in? The first step we do is we do a typo mapping. This basically means that we map the query that comes in to the closest word that's in our product database. So this accounts for a lot of typos, um, but it's also not super robust. So this is something that we're still actively um, trying to improve. After that, we have a step in which we uh, retrieve synonyms and anti-synonyms. So these are search terms for which we also want to retrieve the results or actually exclude them. For example, for the query milk, we want to exclude coconut milk. So even though the term milk in a lexical search will probably have results on coconut milk, we choose a business rule that says, okay, we don't want to show this product because it's just not relevant. And this is a manually maintained list and it's highly subjective. For example, a rule can be that you don't show mozzarella when someone searches for cheese, which you can argue is actually a good valid result. Um, so we have that step, and after that we, uh, we generate the candidates. So we generate 108 candidates, which are our first three search pages, uh, and those will go into learning to rank. And how that's done is basically it's keyword matching using the typo-corrected queries and the synonyms and anti-synonyms uh, using Elasticsearch. After that we have our learning to rank. Uh, where we split our uh, data, and, our, and with our data I mean our click logs, we split it along the temporal dimension, so uh, in time, and we create the relevancy labels. Uh, and now we'll get to that in the next slide, so don't <coughs> worry. Um, and after that, what we used to do in the old setup is we retrieved the feature values, but we only had an online feature store, so only the latest values were stored. And that was a very severe limitation because, of course, the features now are different from at the time that we're collecting the data. And then these features, together with the labels, were passed to XGBoost, which is our learning to rank uh, model that we're currently using, and the uh, model trains to, to, uh, to predict the best ranking for us. And the reason we choose XGBoost is because it's actually very fast, which uh, really helps in our latency, and it's actually very competitive. Even to date, it's still one of the best options for learning to rank, in our humble opinion. Um, so, like I said, I would get back to how we actually de define the relevancy labels. So what we used to do in our old setup is that we aggregated everything within a certain time frame. So say, for example, four weeks. We took all the interactions of our users, within the search domain, and we saw, okay, we aggregate to a query product level. So for every query, which products are uh, bought by a user. Then we first account for position bias. As we all know, the first positions get a lot more views and might also, hence, get a lot more interactions on them. But Vincent will tell you more about that later, how exactly we do that. Then we aggregate over this entire time period until we have query product pairs. And those scores are then normalized to a zero to one range. And that really allows us to then bin the labels. And what I mean with that is we convert it to zero uh, to four discrete labels. And the reason we chose that at the time is that we argued that uh, products with very similar relevancy 
are fine to switch around in the ranking. If you have highly relevant products, does it really matter which one is above the other? If they're more or less the same score, maybe not so much. So we don't want to punish the model for that. On the other hand, when we have a pair of uh, a very irrelevant products, so label zero, and a very highly relevant product with label four, we do want to, of course, punish the model if it gets them the wrong way around. <coughs> Thanks. Yeah, so Luke already explained a bit uh, what the previous setup looks like, and this is to illustrate it uh, a bit more in detail. So previously, we aggregated all of the events, all of the click interactions on a query and product level, and then we joined all of the matching features according to that. Uh, but as you can see, it's much more difficult then to also join things on a customer level because it's all aggregated away. Uh, so what we're doing now is that uh, every uh, interaction event is basically becoming one training observation. So every impression, even if you scroll, if you go to the next page, that's easily 40, 50 training observations. You can see that the data set is going to blow up drastically because now instead of everything, uh, aggregating everything, we now have single events. But it does allow us to have a customer and a timestamp in those train observations, which means that we can join the feature values much more accurately. Um, so with personal feature values that we can join now, we have all sorts of segments that we can add. Um, but also, the feature values might change throughout time for the same customer. So if you have a customer performing one session, that session is in the train data. Maybe a couple sessions later, the feature values have been updated, and uh, the feature values are now much different. Uh, so this will help the model to truly learn about the information that we had at that point in time. And during inference, this means that uh, the model is much more reliable and you're going to see that your offline evalu evaluation metrics are very much the same as your online evaluation metrics. So this is what it looks like. Previously, we aggregated all of the at the baskets and currently, since it's single events, uh, it's, it looks initially like uh, a binary label. So uh, all of the impressions are events in the training observations, and then positive events like add to baskets are going to be joined, um, and then those are seen as positive labels. Uh, we'll go a bit more into detail later about how we change those uh, binary labels to continuous labels and how we incorporate all sorts of things like position bias, but this is in general uh, the first uh, big change that we uh, uh, applied. Uh, Luke also mentioned uh, the time dimension, and uh, let's say we have an example here of one customer. A customer comes in, and we don't really have any information about the customer because the customer is new. Maybe one important feature is whether the customer previously bought a product, yes or no. Uh, this can be uh, usually important in whether the customer is going to buy this again. Uh, if we're going to borrow information from the future from an online database, then there's huge data leakage, and the model is also definitely going to overfit uh, on that data, because if the customer has purchased this product, then in this scenario it means the customer has purchased it in the future. So we wanted to get rid of that uh, straight away. And the way we do that is now we have an offline feature store and an online feature store. Uh, so the online feature store is memory-based. It's supposed to be super fast, and we only use that uh, during uh, inference. So it will also only need to capture the, the latest state information. So only the latest feature values for every customer. The offline feature store uh, is going to capture the full history with all of the timestamps associated for those feature values. So when we create our training data set, we can join them based on those timestamps and additional entity uh, identifiers. And then we have all the accurate information that we had at that point uh, for the train observation. Um, in our scenario, uh, this, it needs to be very much in sync so that we train on exactly the information that we can expect uh, during inference. Um, and we use a Kafka topic to materialize, to kind of send over all of the feature values that we create. So we create the feature values in Databricks. Uh, we store them in an offline store that's a little slower, but we can parallelize and then uh, create a huge uh, training data set. We materialize through Kafka, and then the online feature store is queried during inference time. Uh, so this is kind of high over what that looks like. We have all of the impressions. We have to add, uh, the add to carts, and those is kind of, that is kind of like the basis of your train observations. Um, and then we can join for all, from all sorts of feature tables, uh, for different entities, all of the feature values point in time accurately. So maybe we have some features for an entity uh, customer based on a customer ID. Uh, maybe some other values are aggregated on a product level or on a query product level, like add to cart rates. Uh, we can join them all point in time accurately. Um, this um, seemingly small change can allow us to do a couple things. Um, as I said, we can 
uh, change the ranking for every customer. We can change the ranking throughout time, but also a lot of features might be uh, time dependent. So uh, bonus articles, so which products are discounted, that is something that changes throughout time. And with those aggregated events, it's much more difficult to incorporate that really well in the model. Uh, we can add seasonality, demographic features, and we have a customer feature store with all sorts of uh, feature values on that customer, uh, readily available that we can uh, query uh, very quickly during inference time. And eventually, the final goal is to truly do personalization. So segmentation could be seen as some sort of like embedding of the data in like a low dimensional space. But eventually, the idea is to do true personalization, get away from segmenting, and use the full purchase history in order to embed the customer's uh, demands and wishes, basically, and um, change the ranking accordingly. This is one uh, small example that, uh, that we're using for the features. So maybe um, changing up the ranking, something simple that we can do is already say, OK, we have customers in different stages of life. So maybe a young customer is going to have very different uh, wishes uh, for the same query than an older customer. So that's one a very simple segmentation to do. Um, another one is to use uh, different price segments. Some customer uh, might be very much looking for cheaper products. Someone else might be looking for um, high quality products and doesn't care so much for uh, about the price. Um, so those are all small segments that we can overlap and then we can already uh, switch up uh, the ranking quite a bit. And additionally, this is a food profile. So we've seen that even if you're the same stage of life and you might have similar uh, money to spend basically on, uh, uh, on your groceries, uh, then we sti still see very different uh, results in terms of the products that you, uh, that you want to buy. So we created some clusters, and we call it food profiles. So maybe some con uh, customer is a bit more like a conscious shopper, and someone else is much more convenient, someone is more traditional. Uh, so we have all sorts of clusters that we can immediately plug in, and then uh, using that, we can already swap and change up the, the ranking quite a bit. So this will help us to, uh, even if many customers are applying the same uh, search query, to change the ranking quite a bit, um, so that more people will click on uh, the highest ranked uh, products. Yep. So until now, we've really talked only about customer relevancy. But is customer relevancy really only the relevancy that exists? So we start with our mission statement, uh, which is Albert Heijn Broad, which is together we make better food or eating better the easy choice for everyone. And what we mean with that is that as market leaders, we also recognize our sort of duty to also help people choose the right products for them, steer them more towards the healthier choices when available. And also we like to make, uh, or we would like to reduce our impact on the climate. So we've actually tightened our CO2 emission goals uh, for the future. And these are things that we should also consider when we're presenting people with results at search. Furthermore, the e-commerce grocery uh, field is highly competitive. It's very small margins, and we re heavily rely on optimizations and big customer orders. And as, as of today, we don't know any party in the Netherlands that has been able to make this profitable on the long run. And even looking outside of the Netherlands, there's few or no parties that have actually been able to do this because just so high cost of delivering these products to people's doorstep. So this really makes us think, is relevancy really only customer relevancy? Or should we also consider these bigger concepts? And at Albert Heijn, we do actually believe so. So the way we do that is um, actually a very simple way, which I will explain to you now. So of course, our first factor is still the customer relevancy. Of course, it's still super important to show people the right products. Uh, we don't want to have them uh, to, to, uh, to scare them away, basically. And measures for this can be, for example, the MRR the, or the NDCG, or also conversion rate. But then also, we should consider the profitability. So what money do we make shipping this product to your doorstep? At the end of the day, we need to make money as well. Furthermore, healthy sales. So like I said, we really recognize our sort of duty to steer customers to make the better choices. So metric for uh, that is that we uh, calculate the share of products with Nutri-Score A and B that people buy compared to other products that they buy. And we really think that steering customers to more healthy choices actually really uh, contributes to society. 
And lastly, like I said, the environmental impact for which measures are, of course, the CO2 emission of a certain product, but also package recyclability. To what extent is the package recyclable? Can you recycle the majority of it, or is it all throwaway plastic? And the way we combine this, or can combine this, is actually very simple. We just look at all these different metrics and we normalize them. So we normalize them against like, the best possible result for a certain query. So that would give us a zero to one range. And then with a basic weighted sum in which we can attribute the weights ourselves, we can combine one single term of relevancy. And that's actually what replaces our, uh, our labels when we train a model. And the reason we did that is that we saw that this actually yielded better results than doing it in some sort of post-processing. So when using XGBoost, we really saw that um, it really learns a more fine-grained and a more specific uh, representation of these different aspects than we would with some sort of post-processing, which are basically just hard rules. So now I've only really discussed our side and the customer side, but of course we also have suppliers, the people who make the food. And they actually want to sell as much of the product as they can. But that's also a very careful balance for us, because at search we want to show relevant results. But that's of course difficult if you come in with a new product, then how do we determine if you're relevant? That's one of the problems that we're facing. And also, the other way around, if we steer too much on visibility, so new products comes in, we put it very high in our ranking, it might be actually not be super relevant, and our customers might churn away. And these are problems that were very, uh, are very hard to navigate, and Vincent will actually also go into that uh, later, how we're trying to do that a lot better. Yes, so then a bit of a continuation of relevancy. So what we might see offline does not tra always translate to online. And I've heard it already a couple times here in the talks that offline metrics aren't always exactly representative of online metrics. And we saw with our switch to using unaggregated data that actually it's already starting to get a lot better, but it's not entirely there yet. So it might not mean that what we see in our offline data set actually translates to online performance. And that's why we really work in a continuous development way, uh, which is very driven on A-B testing. And I think this is an open door. I think most of you out here are actually also A-B testing. Uh, but I love to kick in open doors, so I'll go through it anyways. So our cycle basically starts from an idea. We think, OK, this feature or this model will yield some improvement. It can be customer relevancy, it can be CO2 emissions. We develop a new model or a new feature, we train the model, we evaluate on our test set. Then we have a checkpoint. Basically, does it look good on our offline test set? Yes or no? If yes, we go to our acceptance uh, develop, uh, area and we do an A-B test. If that's successful, we deploy it to production, report to our stakeholders, we say we made this impact in this amount of time, and the cycle repeats. And this really allows us to iterate really quickly with ideas, and it really allows us to throw away ideas that are not that great, uh, or doesn't yield the, the results that we expect them to. And what we also do is that this is not a cycle that just repeats, repeats. We also do uh, it in synchronous matter, where we have A-B tests running side by side, under the assumption that the interaction effects between A-B tests may actually be very negligible. Uh, and with that, we actually put the asterisk that it's also good to, over time, look at, OK, how is my model performing now compared to a model that I had in production, say, six months ago? So then you can see if your incremental improvements, which you proved through your A-B testing, actually stack up together to make a bigger impact, or if they're just canceling each other out, more or less. <coughs> So we've talked about um, uh, the relevancy label quite a couple of times. So let's uh, go a bit more into detail now what that looks like. Um, so this, uh, in this scenario, we have to query milk. And we have uh, five different products on five different uh, positions. We aggregate it uh, at the baskets here. So we can see that on position one, there were 200 ads. Then on position two, uh, there were 150. And then it dropped off uh, quite quickly. So the first thing that we want to do is kind of take away the position bias. Because for the query milk, maybe the, the product on position one is very similar to the product on position, I don't know, 70 or something. But still, on position one, especially for 
such items like milk, you don't really think about it that, that much. You're not going to uh, browse for that long just to find the optimal milk for you. Um, so you're much more uh, inclined to just click on the milk on position one. So we want to kind of take away the bias from the existing model or maybe previous policies that we applied. Uh, and we do that by uh, using inverse propensity scoring. Um, so we kind of uh, have an overall look over the entire uh, query base and see uh, how many ads are there on position one and then on position two, three, et cetera, and then we kind of get a fraction. Uh, so we account for that fraction, and as you can see now, if we then uh, divide the add-to-baskets by that fraction depending on the position, uh, then we kind of de bias in that way and say that, okay, the next time, apparently it would have been better if we put uh, the product to that particular milk carton on position one, uh, because we estimate that it would be better than uh, the, the current product that we have on position one. This kind of give, uh, gives all of the products a fair chance to uh, to be the best out there, so it's kind of a fair competition. Uh, and it also allows us much better to improve our models, because if we don't take away this bias, it's going to be much harder to uh, beat your baselines uh, when you're training models. So that's one. Um, and then Luke already also explained about uh, the relevancy label. So it's a combination. So first we normalize this position adjusted score. Um, and then in this scenario, we look at uh, contribution margin, which is like profitability of the product. Um, and that might be positive or negative. So it could very well be that on some uh, particular products, uh, we make a loss. And what we think is that it would be much better for Albertine uh, if products that we don't make a loss on, loss on or actually make money on are ranked a little bit higher. So it's always trying to find that balance between uh, being uh, organically as relevant as possible, as well as uh, trying to make a profit in the long term, because obviously that's, that's also very important. If we uh, tweak the weight a little bit too high for that contribution margin value, then we'll definitely see a drop off in relevancy labels. People will scroll more to find the products that they were looking for or maybe abandon altogether. And shopping uh, baskets will decrease and you get unhappy customers. So it's, it's a fine balance that we continuously have to strive for. But it's kind of like a simple framework that we can utilize um, to incorporate all sorts of metrics uh, that we have, like CO2 emission or healthiness, uh, maybe in the future. Um, we said that we do everything now on a point-wise basis, um, so it works kind of the same here. Um, all of the uh, single events uh, are still in the train data set and we can still scale that relevancy label, uh, but now there is quite a big target imbalance. Um, so maybe we have 40 uh, negative events for every uh, positive event, because naturally you uh, see a lot of products, but maybe you only add one to your basket. Um, if we add all of these training observations to the actual model, then the model is going to be already pretty satisfied that it can distinguish between positive and negative events. So then it's more uh, looking at the organic uh, label. However, if we downsample those negative events quite a lot more, so let's say three negative events for every positive event, then we can see that the model is both uh, able to distinguish between positive and negative events, as well as distinguish between the absolute values of that positive event. So by doing so, uh, we actually get the model to optimize for the things that we want it to optimize for. Um, another problem or problem, something that we have to deal with is the, the cold start problem. So in this scenario, someone is searching for cucumber and from history, we know that the Albert Ein cucumber and maybe the bio cucumber uh, are definitely the best fit. So maybe we have some feature values like add to cart rate based on a query product combination. And then for cucumber, that is going to be uh, a super good fit, obviously. But maybe now we have a new product uh, and that is a cucumber salad uh, and it doesn't have an add to cart rate yet. So how do we deal with that? Well, one of the, the options that we can go for is to say we're going to artificially increase those add to cart rates uh, so that at least the products will get a chance to be at the top for a little while or maybe not necessarily at the top but at least somewhere where it will get a lot of impressions uh, and then uh, we over time decrease the weight uh, for that artificial boost of the feature values uh, so then naturally it will kind of come down uh, to its organic position where it belongs but at least uh, in the beginning it got a chance to be uh, at the top and we can learn from that additional variance that we have in the data now. So that's one approach. Um, another approach is uh, a bit more complex but to apply an exploration strategy. 
Um, so exploration means that we're going to mix up the search results a bit more extreme uh, just to get the v additional variance in our data. So maybe with a new product, put it at position one, and then sometimes two, and then sometimes eight, because we don't really know yet. The model is uncertain about this prediction, and we just want to see how it performs. Uh, obviously, that this can come at the cost. So if that cucumber salad is going to be at the top, then uh, that, is, uh, uh, that might be expensive, because then that is not the best fit. Uh, so people have to scroll more, and we lose uh, customers again. But if we do this only at a very small uh, fraction of our data, uh, we add the additional variance to the data. We can learn from that variance to see, like, okay, for which customers, given which context and which feature values, uh, is this a very good match? Um, but, and we can utilize this uh, for the other 97% of the search queries that we have. So this uh, small exploration fraction kind of enables us to uh, have a, a model that is better understanding all of the interactions that we have in the data, and we can utilize that uh, and balance that exploration, exploitation trade-off. That's the idea. Yep, so I will uh, address our, basically our last topic of today, uh, which is semantic search uh, and alternatives, and then we'll get to what alternatives means. It's already been mentioned quite a lot throughout this conference what semantic search is. Um, so I guess it doesn't need that much introduction, but here's a, a quick reason why we need it in product search. So here are two uh, people are looking for satay sauce and pinda sauce. And these are terms in the Netherlands that we use interchangeably to mean the same thing. It's basically a peanut sauce that we put on satay meat. And we also have in our product data products that either use the term pinda sauce or satay sauce. So what we want is that these two users are presented with exactly the same result. And as I've mentioned before, we have this manually curated uh, synonyms list. And that's what we're using now to make sure that the, uh, our customers see both satay sauce and pinda sauce, no matter on which they search. But of course, that's not really maintainable. So that's why we really want to push a bit on semantic search. Um, and we're currently uh, exploring that. But we did see that it's quite a difficult problem because what we're doing is we're mapping a very short query. And in product search, especially e-commerce, uh, grocery, the terms are very, very short. People don't look for brown leather jacket, which already includes three terms, for example, but people look for milk, chocolate, um, maybe not even chocolate, but Chuck, for example, and they already expect the results to show up. And that's why we struggled a bit to map these short queries to big product descriptions. So a problem we first looked at as a way up, a stepping stone for us, is alternatives. So alternatives are basically, yeah, as the name implies, alternative products. So when a product is out of stock, we don't want our users or our customers to go to another store. We want them to buy, preferably, an alternative product maybe a bio version of a product, or maybe a different type of vegetable. But also in our recipes, we want to offer our customers the opportunity to swap out a product for something that's perhaps more sustainable, something that's vegan, something that's vegetarian, all these options, which basically relies on us somehow having to know which products are alternatives for each other. So the way we do that is we um, take a pair of products, we embed them, and using cosine similarity, we get a similarity score, and we compare that to a label. And the label can be one of both. It can be a manually created list. So we have also manually uh, created a list of some pairs of products that are alternatives for each other, but also from our data. So of course, as, I saw, as you saw, uh, the lane is already shown to customers. So this really gives us insights into, OK, what do people actually buy when they see that lane? And that's a very good source for us to train a new model on to know, OK, these products are actually alternatives for each other. And then what happens under the hood is that it, of course, creates an embedding space where similar products are grouped together. And now we want to take it a little step further, which is the concept of swaps. I already mentioned it a little bit with recipes, is that we don't want exact alternatives all the time, but we might want a vegan alternative or a vegetarian alternative. And what we found is that if you have actually a good product embedding space, it actually 
in many of the cases, already works by just embedding the change that you want to make. And this change can just be the string, for example, vegan. And as long as this term is captured in the product descriptions, it actually works quite well. So, for example, vegan, vegetarian, gluten-free, they work relatively well. Looking at more abstract um, concepts, such as more sustainable, those are still quite hard. But we really found that this was a nice stepping stone towards semantic search. And then I will conclude a little bit with what we think is going to be the future of search at Albert Heijn. So, like I said, we are really exploring semantic search. And we don't know if it's going to be a silver bullet. And from the talks I've heard here, uh, I doubt that it will be. But I think it's definitely going to contribute to getting rid of those anti-synonyms and synonyms lists that we manually curate, but also the need for our customers to rephrase their query. As also mentioned before by Vincent, we're really heavily focusing on personalization. Due to the repeating buying behavior of our customers, their past says a lot about their future. So really think that we can tailor the search experience a lot more, and this will create better customer relevancy. And we think both of these can be done in a two-tower model, which is something that we're now in the baby uh, steps of, uh, of exploring. Then also full orchestration. What I mean with that is now, uh, like I said, we have these different relevancy objectives. And we have awaited some of them with manual weights. But of course, it's better to learn these and have a, m a model that adjusts over time. Also, we have sponsored products, so uh, our suppliers can choose uh, to uh, be an ad inside our search. And currently, they're fixed positions, but we also want to dynamically change the, those based on the relevancy. And lastly, automatic retraining. So what we want is to retrain peri periodically, sorry, uh, without human intervention, uh, or much human intervention. And this is to stay up to date with changing preferences of our customers and seasonality. Um, so this is something we're actually already quite far in, and we're now like finalizing what are the criteria to actually go live with a model. Uh, and with that, I actually want to conclude our presentation. I want to thank you for your attention, especially this late in the conference. Uh, I'm happy that you all came. Uh, so thanks for that. Uh, I hope there's a little bit of time for questions. Uh, and otherwise, please don't hesitate to, uh, to find us. Thank you. Thank you.